So thanks for the, the interesting uh, blockchain intro. I was actually hoping we would get some intro into general blockchain stuff because I'm going to get into more niche topics. And I just told uh, Mitze here that the previous talk was super interesting. Seems like we have, we like blockchain coders and coders in general have some stuff in common because I also have an anima phase generator for NFTs uh, using generative adversarial networks. But um, I brought some uh, more niche topics here because everyone can do the crypto zombies and free code camp solidity stuff to learn blockchain, but few places will offer you the secrets on how to design blockchains from scratch. And that's going to be my topic today. So the agenda will be why I'm uh, uh, a person you should uh, listen to regarding designing blockchains, then why sh you should even consider uh, learning this, uh, this art in, in this industry even. Then we will go through my general design principles, which are strictly personal. So uh, there are no standards in the industry for that. So these are just my experiences. Then some non-technical considerations that your possible clients or prospects will like uh, to see in you. And some special gadgets you can look into in your free time when you are bored with Wikipedia and uh, publicly available books. So. A uh, little, little about my background, so I'm an independent cryptography and blockchain consultant. I'm a, a cryptographic researcher at Magyar Tudományos Akadémia. Criminal advisor, this doesn't mean that I advise criminals on committing fraud and stuff, but the opposite, so I help uh, to, uh, I, I advise on how adverse persistent threats could have been or could have been uh, executed. And of course, an ethical hacker, developer, and VC due diligence where I audit blockchain. So when I'm not creating, I'm audited some more. And I took the courage to be a little arrogant here and uh, highlight two headlines from two of my last projects uh, that I did from which, uh, yeah, this is a little so. So one was Ethereum Foundation. So I was uh, I was uh, working on the Ethereum virtual machine that was presented in the previous talk. And two of my latest were Casper Labs and Quant Platform that made it to market with some good numbers. So I hope that proves um, I know some stuff about designing blockchains. But um, more importantly why you should even consider that. So everyone tries to be a competitor of Ethereum. It's the second largest blockchain, trillions of dollars on it, all the NFTs uh, uh, changing hands. So, but it has huge problems, especially the gas price. Now it's all about gas price problems. And everyone tries to beat them. Actually, lots of new platforms exist that orthogonally, each of them has some killer feature that can beat Ethereum by just that feature, but we haven't seen anything that can beat it overall. But everyone is trying that, and there is a market for it. So if there is competition, there is market. That's super important. The second stuff, it's psychological. Everyone, every blockchain advocate claims that I want to build a free internet, a democratic, decentralized world. My own decentralized world that I can make money out of. Uh, so all of these advocates actually really prefer to have their own blockchain. And if you present them the the, ch the chance to, you can do this whole business idea. Your whole business model can live within Ethereum or another platform. You you will see some uh, discomfort there, but yeah, that's that's not that much money I wanted to make with this business idea. So you will you will restrict to having to design your own blockchain if you make far in this industry. Another reason is that academic advance, uh, especially in cryptography, so cryptography seen a huge bump since um, blockchain applications, is very faster than startup agility, even though startups are all about agility and agile development is like coming out of the tap. Crypto is even worse. Uh, they expect from you even more agility in startups, but the academy is even faster. So you can't keep up. Uh, if you have a blockchain startup, you made a, a blockchain product, or let's say Ethereum. Ethereum is still a startup, so it, people tend to forget that have, being the, 
the second largest cryptocurrency in the world. They must be some kind of enterprise. And actually, they do kind of uh, behave like they are an enterprise, but they are still a startup. And even they can't afford uh, to, to pivot into proof of take, stake that fast as academics made it. So there are like, I don't know, a dozen different proof of stake uh, algorithms implementations with all their proofs. And, but every, every product is still like trying to keep up. Even the most agile ones are just keeping up. Next reason is that if you are talking to institutional or like governmental or large industrial players, um, while they are trying to adopt blockchain, which is, very, which is very good because you also need top-down adoption to make it far, but they can't really afford open source because open source for them means no accountability. And they want to have uh, a Marikanini at the end of the phone, whom they can call like technical support. And blockchain being decentralized and all is just too much of a risk for that. Who are we going to call if something forks or if the network holds for some adversarial behavior? And you have to design blockchains for these people within their own shady uh, server rooms. And the personally for you, the best part why you should do that is that um, you you can't be you can't be a professional swimmer in a puddle. So if you go straight into deep waters, that's going to help a lot. And there is that's the deepest stuff in these blockchain waters when you can design your own chain from scratch. So tech skills needed from developers, from you, uh, in, in order to design something. So if you check out like the, the job offerings, you, you can you can see even more, even higher numbers than this because I took this 40% extra from a 2018 survey by Deloitte so on how much um, blockchain developers. And this, this restricts to DAP developers, so not like blockchain architects. We have no numbers on the blockchain architects because there are only a handful in the world. So if you can do a, a DAP, you can make 40% more than a front-end developer unicorn. And that's why because you need a very diverse skills skill set in computer science for that. Distributed systems, uh, when you have to select which consensus model fits best your client, your adversarial threat model, uh, your network assumptions. Networking, to do the actual like node discovery, Kademlia, DHT, torrenting, you have to be fluent with all that in order to design the peer-to-peer -peer networking. Databases and data structures. Um, I list it here because at the beginning this was not really expected. We made a compromise here. We use key value stores. Yeah, hash is the key, anything else is the data, but we run into problems with that. So uh, an Ethereum archive node is more than 1.6 terabytes by now. And to actually sync it, you need to uh, write into your SSD five or six times that, so you can destroy half of your SSD expectancy uh, a brand new, of a brand new SSD just by syncing a fresh new Ethereum uh, archive node on it. So originally this was not a requirement, but with newer, like third generation blockchains, I don't know why they call it that, new generations do require some very niche database and data structure uh, expertise to overcome these. And of course, cryptography, an absurd amount of the cryptography. Uh, yeah, you have to get into BLS and pairings uh, by now, so you can't make far just by knowing hashes and encryption and public, key, uh, public keys anymore. So the big picture of my general framework uh, in order, actually. The, so you should ask your prospect or possible client when you have to design uh, or when you have a blockchain design gig in this order. Network assumption is most important because it's, it's more often or, yeah, it's, it's actually almost always over, over uh, sight, uh, in an oversight. Nobody talks about network assumptions and uh, threat models. So yeah, network assumptions, data assumptions, threat modeling, like in any any kind of software development, you should hire a general 
security expert or a penetration tester to make your threat model, but smart contracts still need this. Whether you actually need smart contracts, next topic, because most of the time you can get away with the UTXO model presented in the previous talk. But if your client expects any kind of flexibility, then you should do some kind of smart contracts. Distribution of communication, so yeah, not just numbers. So you don't only ask how much transactions are we expecting, but how much we are expecting like generally, what are the spikes, how much are these spikes, so you are, you are interested in the whole bell curve in order to model. Some uniqueness, because usually, as in web development or any kind of software, your clients won't be able to actually tell you what they want, and you have to give a little extra from your own pocket to give them some uniqueness, and we will, uh, I will provide some, some, of these, um, some of these eye candies and of course the deadline, whether can, uh, can they actually uh, afford such sci-fi developments that you are presenting. So network assumptions first, and most important. Uh, you are fam most likely familiar with the CAP theorem because it's very popular in conventional database modeling. So uh, out of the triage of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, CAP theorem states that you can only choose two. And you have to ask your client, and, or if they don't know, you have to model out from the business model that which one are they, which one are they willing to sacrifice. Consistency, availability. Consistency means that all of the nodes see the same stuff, and there is no inconsistencies between the data. Availability, that if you query something from the blockchain, you will get a result, and it's not going to like time out or give error. And partition tolerance is that the network can't really separate into two or three or multiple isolated entities. So the network stays connected. And you can't get all three. Some blockchains with ridiculous marketing stunts will claim that they solve the cap, cap trilemma and the blockchain trilemma, and they offer all three but you shouldn't believe that. It's computer science 101. It's part of the theorem that you can't solve the theorem. So everyone who claims that is just making PR uh, stunts. Second, and in my opinion, even more important network assumption uh, that you don't really hear uh, about in conventional database modeling is the FLP theorem, uh, which say that uh, if you have an async network, you can't reach consensus in a deterministic way. So if messages could be arbitrarily delayed because networks are bad or your players are bad, so they are intentionally keeping offline in the middle of a protocol, then you can't be absolutely sure that consensus happened in a secure way. You have to choose between, between that. And yeah, some blockchains will also claim that they solve the FLP problem because they offer hundreds of thousands of deterministic transactions in, with the consensus in an ASIC network, and you shouldn't believe that. And you should also model which one you are willing to sacrifice your go for a partially sync or a fully synchronous model, or uh, go away with a, a non-deterministic protocol, so a probabilistic one that I have 99%, I'm 99% sure that whatever came out of this consensus as a new block is right. And the third one, the Zuko triangle, which actually Zuko very arrogantly named after himself, even though originally this was Schneier's triangle, almost two decades before Zuko, some, for some reason it's, it's named after him, is more about UX. So out of the third triangle, you can only choose two, from decentralized to truly decentralized, secure, and human meaningful, which means good UX. And you should only choose two, and my personal taking is that you should always sacrifice human meaningful, because you can make up good UX on the front-end side. Blockchain development, 99% will stay on back-end side, we will talk about that later, and you can make all the sacrifices you made there with very slick UIs and great mobile UX. So, coming out of the three lemmas, standards, formats, regulations. So it's very cool that on GitHub and in the books, you have 
very lazy solutions to uh, every kind of industry problems, but when you actually encounter industry players who are ordering you to design chains, you encounter restrictions because there are legal stuff and there are backward compatibility and there are users, uh, uh, users on the market already. So you have these constraints. Even worse, if you encounter governmental or industrial players, they will require some EU or ISO standard like OPC UE. Telecommunication companies will require that the only way of serializing transactions that everything on the chain happens through ASN.1. And we are not used to that. We use protobuf and stuff with agile development and backends. But you have to use that. OK, X509 uh, is, is pretty standard. In, uh, for us too. So yeah, open source and all is really great that we are flexible, we are agile, we go through or go fast and break everything. But some of our clients won't really appreciate if you go fast and break their existing models. So you create the great value when you can personally create a, a low risk bridge for these people. So summarizing my best practices on network assumption, never go full uh, AC. So you have to get partition tolerance some way into the into your model. Don't ever let uh, to happen to you what IOTA did. So if you hear, heard about IOTA network, it's a blockchain DAG backed by Microsoft and Bosch and all and they made an IC network with huge numbers which split into two different networks eventually because they sacrificed the P out of the cap. Uh, if you can always go for full asynchrony, uh, it's really, really popular, especially in proof of stake times to go for partial synchrony. So messages can be delayed up to some unknown uh, bound, but even that's really unrealistic because there are Bangladeshi teenager hackers and Russians who, who behave in a really adversarial manner. And there are, especially in Hungary, uh, there are uh, networks like if, if you are doing like uh, something for a hospital, there are just really catastrophical situations in, in terms of networks in delays and lags out there. So if you can always assume the worst out of your network, either because general conditions or, or hackers uh, and go full async and make up the rest with, with like treasure, threshold uh, clocks or something. And as I said, always sacrifice the human meaningful because that's the only way you can make up. If you sacrifice security, there is no way you can get out of that and you're just gonna be uh, a victim of a hacking. Just today, someone who made a compromise on security in, uh, how do I say, in favor of human meaningful, today was a uh, $170 million uh, smart contract hack, which actually was not a smart contract hack, so they got out the money from the smart contract, but through the UI, through the front end, because they made uh, two hasty decisions on that. So da data assumptions. How much time do I have? Okay. So data assumptions. Um, how many players, okay, how many players will be in your uh, game theoretical network and whether they are willing to store data, so you have to confront uh, your client that storing a blockchain comes with lots of data because you have to store everything and are they really willing to do that? So buy the SSDs because for really fast chains you need the latest, uh, uh, the latest and fastest uh, SSDs, especially if your consensus depends on storage stuff. How much they are willing to store? Most likely, especially in Hungary, that's going to be a way too low number that when you, what you actually require. And whether they want to search uh, on top, because generally you can't really make complex queries on, on blockchain stuff. So you, you have transactions, transactions have an ID, like a, a, a check that you got uh, from a store. And you can't really make queries that what, what I bought from this store in the past years based on checks, you can just get the paper and check manually. And this is the same with blockchain. So this is transactional thinking. And usually you can't do that. But because it's so new, even the CTO of the other side is going to expect from you that you can make SQL-like queries. And of course you can do that, but that's additional development. 
So, yeah, a little about the game theoretical stuff that I mentioned. So, because the main and the only reason you should introduce blockchain in the business model is to solve distrust. So there has to be some kind of game theoretical conflict between two players in the model. And if there is no, then you go home. Uh, and there is the misconception that if a single business entity, so a single uh, a game theoretical player, like a single company maintains 40 nodes on AVS servers uh, across the globe, that consists of 40 nodes, but that's just still one node because that's still entity in the distrust. So you need like an enemy of yourself who doesn't trust you and that one to run the servers. And you have to have to take that into account when you talk about numbers and how much uh, how much data I should expect because your client is going to say 200, but in reality that's going to be four or five. And you have to design a consensus and data assumptions according to that. And can they afford thinking to others? So especially during COVID, this was a, uh, a big dilemma last year that everyone moved to home offices. Some home offices even uh, considered using blockchains. And when you provided them with the idea that, yeah, blockchains are synchronized nodes and stuff, uh, they told you, told you that, but we are a legal company. We can't synchronize stuff between borders. That's like the law here. And you, um, you encounter that even though technically they do want to solve these, legally they can't. Sometimes uh, the data can't even leave the same building uh, of their offices. And you have to model a blockchain solution uh, in those conditions. So. Next stuff is how we, uh, especially with Chaya Network uh, that came along uh, this year, we, we messed with the natural order of IT because in conventional IT, the cheapest resource you have is storage. You can always buy a new uh, HDD or a new drive and it's, and it's the most, uh, most cheap uh, hardware you can get. But in blockchain, it's just the opposite. So computation is not really expensive because you can only do the most primitive stuff. So an Ethereum virtual machine is, ex is actually really dumb. Um, so it, uh, it's not really expensive to do the additions and the multiplications. They, uh, they cost like two or three gas compared to storing, which costs like 140,000 uh, gas. So storing stuff on blockchain because, because you have to store it everywhere. So just storing one data and if you have 40 nodes, uh, one byte of data with 40 nodes is going to be 40. So it's scaled linearly, which is very bad. We like uh, logarithmically scaling stuff in, in blockchains. So you want to minimize storage by with some decentralized stores. And if you're familiar with the IPFS or DOT or StoreJ, MadeSafe, uh, we, can, we can play with those with uh, data assumptions. So your best options, uh, in case you want to already Google GitHub that, because this, this was a lot, lots of problems, and you want to Google on GitHub which are the best options for you. So personally, I go for RocksDB. These are, this is developed, this is actually a fork of LevelDB. LevelDB is used in Bitcoin. It's made by Google. Very great, excellent stuff. RocksDB is a fork that was made by Facebook, which is even greater, even faster, even better. And I noted here LMDB because it's like half memory, so it's wholly memory mapped uh, database, which is very interesting uh, to see. And the only example I have on that is Monero. And a little back on that SQL term. So you, yeah, I, I tried to scare you on really, really trying to avoid uh, SQL modeling on top of transactions, but your client comes first and sometimes you can't avoid that. So most likely you will need to build some kind of front end because so far we only talked about back end ish development on blockchains uh, and blockchain development takes large amounts of time. So I think my record was one and a half year to go from white paper to actual software. And that's a long time to go for market. Your investors are going to really anxious. Your users are going to really uh, going to be really anxious and you need some kind of uh, eye candy to, to cure their, uh, their anxiety. 
And that's a, that I can is most likely a val wallet or explorer. So when you can see that ah, I sent some coins here or I interacted with the blockchain and I can check the transaction on a fancy web application, you, you absolutely need that for these anxiety disorders that your client's gonna have. But the problem is you need a full stack web development team for that. So you have to model the SQL around the transactions. You have to educate your uh, database architect a little about your blockchain structures. You need to do some transactional thinking workshops uh, in your company and that's, that's hard money. So okay, putting data, data assumptions behind us. Next one is security threat model because one of the skills I noted here is cryptography, an absurd amount, and cryptography is strong up to the point when you actually uh, know how to use them. So you have to model whether your clients can actually, do they actually know what a private key is, what their wallet is, what that you should make backups of the seed phrase. Do they leave the server rooms open for the cleaning uh, personnel in the, because no matter how stronger, uh, cryptographic stack you put together if the nodes are accessible for unauthorized people. Uh, so, you, so you do the basic software development threat modeling here, which I advise to use the NIST uh, SP8030 framework for, uh, for that. And you should hire a penetration uh, tester to do this for you. And after you have the threat model, uh, you already know that, okay, these are not really uh, people or the nodes that, that were told to me are not really distrusting each other because uh, they are some, some kind of partners at the end of the day. So on legal terms, they are not really enemies, only technically, and they just want the blockchain because it's cool and yeah, it's hype. And with good threat modeling, you will reach these answers and that immediately tells you that, okay, I can use proof of authority consensus because these are not really playing against each other but they are actually teammates. So yeah, the threat modeling uh, comes with a huge amount of sensors in, in modeling. Smart contracts, whether you need them. Most of the time, no, no, most of the time you will need that, need that because people like to build platforms, not just in blockchain, but platform as a service and platform building is, is very hype now um, in, in IT. And most likely when you encounter designing blockchains, you will need a platform, which trivially implies that you need smart contracts because platforms, you, have to, uh, you need other people to program them. But there are some cases, especially the aforementioned governmental and institutional players, that their business logic is so hardly set in stone that, and you won't ever change them, that you can get away that you model the whole business model in the consensus and don't touch it, like the UTXO is an example. So the business model of Bitcoin is that you transfer integers, okay? Technically a little incorrect because you can also make smart contract-ish stuff on Bitcoin. It also has a programming language, but nobody uses them. They just send the coins. So it's, it's just to transfer integers and it's set in stone. Bit abuse of notation here. So my general advice uh, though is that even if they say that the business logic is set in stone but we need to be flexible for later uh, in, con in conventional web development we already know what that means. It's gonna, make, it's gonna mean scope change, scope creep is coming and that's why you should leave a uh, smart contract in your in your planning because if they want some kind of flexibility in the model now, they're gonna expect even more a year later when you're actually ready with your, with your uh, platform. Go for WebAssembly if you can. I'm not saying this because I was part of the WebAssembly team in Ethereum Foundation, but because I know that Ethereum Virtual Machine has its flows and WebAssembly is maintained by the V3.3 uh, community, they have more time for that. Ethereum Foundation is heavily focused on proof of stake and sharding. Uh, yeah, and in open source world, you leave, you leave uh, your components to the people who can handle it best. And WebAssembly is handled by the people who can, uh, uh, who can, whom you can trust with that. 
and use pre-compile contracts for the most common transaction types to save gas. So there is no, uh, there is no saying that everything has to be gas metered uh, individually on the chain. And you, you add up the final gas price just by going through the operations you do. If something is really, really common, for example, transferring ERC tokens, you can always make a pre-compile for that. You do an if close that, yeah, if this is the kind of transaction I'm expecting 80% uh, percent of the time, then that's going to be a fix. I don't know, 100 gas, and you, you saved a lot. And that's why I asked at the beginning uh, distribution of uh, communications from Mikarlin. So how many transactions are we expecting, and what, what are the spikes? Uh, this is why, because from those numbers, you can uh, categorize that, OK, are going to have this and that much transactions of this type. That's going to be pre-compiled. And all the extra logic that I can't model here is going to be standard. Um, yeah, standard uh, uh, smart contracts. And of course, from the players, so if you have few players and many transactions, you should think of layer two because that's synonym for layer two. You can afford uh, state channels and, and changing assets by, the key, by changing keys. Uh, these are the two most popular ways of layer two modeling if you have few players and uh, many, many transactions. OK, so some extra non-technical stuff you're going to encounter. Because at the beginning of my blockchain designing career, I was super eager to put this technical stuff in front of people and always hit walls, these walls. That you can't do that. Yes, it will be like that you are really uh, enthusiastic, but that's not going to work because it's sci-fi. And you have to slow down. These are the breaks you should consider. So. Uh, in general, a blockchain is even more startup-ish than like web companies. So if you have an idea, you have at most like half a year to go to market, or it's wrecked <laughs> uh, for you. And that's my personal opinion, of course. Uh, know, your, know your legal stuff. So because crypto is a wild west, regulations change month by month, countries uh, can take away your your uh, security compliance paper overnight from you, and you have to always keep up this. So, what country is the best uh, for this type? Because if you have like a gambling token, you have to merge the two, and you have to know that which country allows really good crypto regulations that have good gambling of uh, gambling regulations. So you don't. Don't point into Estonia or Singapore just because they have got crypto, because there may be some other kind of conflict there. So you know your legal stuff uh, around crypto and your most common use cases. Yeah, keep up with your competitors, because if you hear that we have no competitors because we are first on the market, we are so smart, that means you have no market at all. So there is rarely anything new under the sun in 2021. And we only have smarter wrappings for all stuff. Think about Uber and Airbnb, the latest unicorns or Revolut. And allocate huge amounts of time, money and time for community building because, yeah, crypto community is a bloody and unforgiving community. So you have only one chance there. They are they are talking to each other, so don't expect that information is somehow not going to uh, leave about uh, a rock pool plan. They are furious on Reddit and bloody handed, and they check your NFTs like hounds on Twitter. So, so uh, yeah, good, take good care with good money and with a couple community managers uh, in your community. And don't make decisions uh, that harms your community. So. Just, just a really, really common example. When I design tokens uh, or ERCs, there is a quantity called total supply because people don't like inflation. So, uh, Bitcoin has 20 million limit, and you can't inflate that. You can't make more Bitcoin out of the 21 million. And ERCs are generally the same. You have a total supply, and that's all. You are not gonna issue any more. And people ask me that, but can we? technically issue more because yeah 
sometimes we need more money, we run out, something didn't go well. And I always tell them that, yeah, technically I can do anything, but your community is not going to like that because crypto people got into crypto because they are bored with high inflation, if especially post-COVID post stuff. And they don't really like that. And they are, they are a bloody bunch. So you will cost more or you need to spend more money on calming down your communities uh, if you do inflation in your EAN3 than to come up with another kind of business plan with the, with the hard cap you have on your tokens. So this is just one example uh, on how unforgiving this can be. And at the end, uh, some like eye candy uh, presence. Um, yeah, this is the time. So we, we developers all know that most of the time the client can't really tell what they actually want. So they can describe like vaguely and you do the rest, most, mostly with UX. So this is most common with uh, web development companies. But blockchains, because it's so hype, we have like Dogelon masks and ships and every kind of anime tokens. There are like thousands and thousands of tokens on the market. And the client won't tell you, but they want some kind of differentiating something that's not formalized because we are so new. So this NFT DeFi hype happened this year. Nobody formalized that. And you have to come up for that. Uh, you have to come up uh, with that for your client. One strategy is that out of the skills that I noted at the beginning, like this uh, distributed computing networking database, you most likely already have more experience in one area than other because you have been, I don't know, a database architect in a web development company for five years and stuff. And I advise to, okay, to stand on your already st uh, strong leg a little more and get into really niche database modelings in your blockchains. Uh, in, in, uh, because you have more lexica and experience in that. And don't be afraid to exercise your power a little. It's going to be an experiment, yeah, uh, but the whole industry is. So on the Bitcoin GitHub repo, if you check it now, it's still written that it's an experimental digital currency and it, it's, worth, uh, it's worth so much money. And some concrete examples. If you have uh, expertise or, or, a, or a considerable past in cryptography, you can exercise these uniqueness features with niche, uh, high, uh, niche uh, advanced cryptographic stuff, like Quantum that I uh, took the headline of um, at the beginning, or identity-based crypto, homomorphic stuff. That's my kind of fetish, yeah. If you uh, if you worked at a telecommunications company uh, for the past 10 years or something, you have huge amounts of experience with erasure codes, which are very popular uh, uh, in blockchain because it allows you more efficient syncings. And you can exercise those, like Rapor is developed by uh, Google for that, Goppa code goes for uh, NIST standardization, Fontaine codes. I made another talk on how to synchronize blockchain based on Fontaine codes. Uh, super efficiently, or if you if you have nothing to do with IT before and you you worked with bioinformatics, okay, that has something to do. So or just virology. So virology, especially this COVID stuff, because you can model peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, based on virology, and some of the new gossips and consensus protocols have like entire chapters comparing the network communication on, uh, based on how viruses in, uh, spread in the world. Because it seems like that's the most optimal way, because nature made viruses optimal in terms of spreading. And we need the same for, for TCP packets and transactions to spread optimally and don't try to reinfect the same node with the same message. And we, are, we started to model peer-to-peer -peer communication based on how COVID uh, spreads. So you can use like totally unrelated experiences on the world to model chains. And of course, virtual machines. That's, I, I think that's the component in Ethereum that's uh, in the worst half. That's why actually we started or uh, uh, back then the, web, uh, the Evosum project and Ethereum too. So we had to change the, the virtual machines because WebAssembly is, is more actively maintained. 
So thanks for your attention. The slides, as usual, will be available on the QR code. So all my slides for all my speeches are public and you can check it back. And yeah, for questions you can, I'm more, I'm faster at Telegram. So write me at Huohuli, like Firefox, um, or, or in email. Thanks. <laughs>